uh, the other side of, side of town, our rival institution, USC. She's a professor of neurology there, and um, she's just fabulous because she literally brings, um, eats, speaks, and breathes everything that she has a passion for. So she um, does research and exercise and various animal models in the lab and um, sees a ton of patients and runs marathons and inspires patients to exercise and runs alongside of them. And so it's just been such a pleasure to have her as a role model for us. And she was very um, sought out as a speaker in this series. And um, we had um, some of her colleagues uh, come on earlier and uh, we've um, Sarah Ingersoll who uh, does that um, amazing program uh, and you can refer back to that and we'll link uh, her video along with Giselle's. Um, and so Giselle works alongside of this uh, group at USC and um, can I, I think is going to teach us a little bit maybe first about why she went into medicine. Um, I know she has a really interesting background and has a twin sister as well. I'm not sure what her twin is up to these days. Maybe she can enlighten us. And then also um, how, why she went into neurology specifically and movement disorders and why she does the type of research that she does. Great. Well, thanks, Indu. Really appreciate the, um, the introduction. And I, I, I'm really um, honored that uh, you consider me running along my patients. I have done that a couple of times. Not that often though, but uh, oftentimes my patients are putting me to shame in terms of how active they are. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, as Indu said, I'm, I'm a practicing Parkinson's specialist, but I also uh, try to uh, do work, obviously in research. I belong to a very large research group and um, I'm just lucky that I, I've got a lot of talented people around, including Indu, who is also a, a colleague of mine who, who helps us as well in our research and gives us good ideas. Um, what I'm gonna do today is uh, kind of walk you through uh, some of the stuff that we've been working on um, in the field of Parkinson's, really focused on exercise and um, kind of give you a, a, a way of thinking about it. Um, I mean, there's a lot of really great people working in the field. So there's a lot of different perspectives, but um, what I'll do is sort of share our kind of, you know, corner of the universe and uh, kind of walk you through, as I said, what we're finding and how we think about what exercise may be doing to help Parkinson's disease. So if it's okay with you, I'm gonna go ahead and get us kind of a short slide set going and then we'll get a chance to talk some more about this and obviously answer as many questions as we can. So with that said, let me, let me get on my desktop and I am going to show you um, my first slide, if I can get it going. Here we go. Yes, so there we yeah, go. Okay. So there's the title of the talk. And as I said, we're gonna focus on plasticity. I just wanted to point out this work has been supported by a lot of really great agencies. I'm pointing out US Army who's funding us currently, but the Parkinson's Foundation and a very close family of mine as well, the Robert. Roberta Gonzalez Family Foundation has also been very important for the work I'm about to show. Um, one of the first things I want to point out, uh, which is going to be really helpful when we think about if exercise effects on the brain, particularly in Parkinson's, is to recognize that Parkinson's, while we think about it as a problem with dopamine, uh, I'm pointing out something a little bit different than what's traditionally thought about in Parkinson's, and I'm showing you circuitry here. And the reason I'm showing you circuits, which is colored in blue and red, and, and obviously I, you can think of this as sort of a Homer Simpson brain, right? This is not quite how the brain looks like, but it is a good example of just the idea that behavior and our movement and thinking is really, uh, is really about connections, right? Brain connections. And what dopamine does really is it enables these connections to work well. So when dopamine levels aren't, aren't normal or, or if they drop, these circuits get affected. And, and so these circuits are really a way, that, again, that one cell, one part of the brain is connecting to the other. So we're gonna really think about that as we go forward and think about what do we mean in terms of connections. And again, I'm highlighting two types of connections because I'm really, interested in two types of ways that exercise affects us, and particularly Parkinson's. I'm focused on the red, which is some of highlighting some of the um, what I would call motor circuits. These are circuits that are involved in, in movement in space. And then the blue circuits, which sort of have a combination of thinking and movement. In other words, it, it allows me to kind of update or think about what I'm doing while I'm moving. Um, so these are called what we call cognitive or thinking circuits. Okay, so remember that point because we're going to get back to it in a second. The other new uh, term that you're going to hear today and was also in the title of the talk is this whole idea of neuroplasticity. And there's a lot of ways to think about it. I, I wanted to highlight a couple ways and then kind of really hone in on the point about exercise. I think the first and foremost thing is what neuroplasticity is about is about those connections. 
So everything I showed you in blue and red, it's really about how those connections are formed and how they re get reorganized. Uh, they are formed obviously through life, but they're constantly kind of being remodeled as we age. And at the fundamental part of those circles that I showed you in red and blue, or what we call synapses. So that's the actual physical connection of one cell to the other. Um, the other point I want to bring out about neuroplasticity is this term called homeostasis, which is reaching kind of a new balance, uh, kind of an efficiency question, uh, an efficiency uh, term, meaning that the brain is always trying to reach the most efficient state. If there's an injury, it's going to make changes in circuits to make it more efficient. So that's also what plasticity is about. So it's about connections. It's about syn synapses, physical connections between one cell to the other. It's about the idea of the brain reorganizing itself. Obviously, as we age, as we learn that's happening, but after injury, it's going to do that as well. And so uh, another very important point about these connections and plasticity is that it's really a fundamental way of how we learn. It's the way we encode things. As I'm learning to read or as I'm learning Spanish, whatever I do to learn, it's happening and being retained because these connections are forming and being, they're being stabilized. So that's a really key feature as we get to the final point. And that is that these mechanisms that are involved in how I created my circuits are actually still there, even in the context of injury. So in a way, you can think about it as uh, a way to repair, if you will, or to enhance these connections, even in the context of injury. And this is sort of where the idea of exercise and we, we can, you know, the rehabilitation field also talks about plasticity as well. So whether you want to consider it as a rehabilitation or as a way of keeping your brain healthy, it's all about those connections and keeping as many connections going as possible so that I'm able to go through my life and have as normal behavior as I can. So let's wind the clock back a little bit and let's talk about um, what we're learning, what we've been learning in people's experiences doing different types of exercise. And we're gonna bring these ideas together as we move through the slides. But what I wanted to point out here is that what was sort of unique about the Parkinson's field was that there has been um, you know, a lot of interest in exercise for a lot of different reasons. Um, I should point out before I talk about this slide that there had been already, uh, since the late 80s, there had been some interesting work that has shown that exercise, or in those individuals that exercise, that there may be some neuroprotective effects, meaning reduced risk. Doesn't mean you're not going to get it, but your chance of getting Parkinson's disease is less. So that's been out there for a while. Um, go forward now into the early 2000s, you began to see people using exercise as a way for uh, improving performance. So this is people who already have Parkinson's disease, and the question now becomes slightly different, which is what happens if I already have Parkinson's disease, can exercise still be helpful for me? That was a big switch in the way of thinking, because remember before that the idea was if I exercise in my life, does it help reduce my risk for developing? That was the first question, but then 2004 the question became even if I have Parkinson's disease, is exercise still meaningful? And a lot of work has come really since probably, again, the late 1990s forward to now, many studies that have shown, particularly when it comes to motor movement, that it's absolutely helpful, meaning that we know that it helps balance, we know it can help gait, it helps quality of life. So that's been pretty well established. There's still a lot of other sort of work going on in that field, but uh, for all intents and purposes, you can say that the field for exercise effects on movement has been pretty good. Um, the other question, remember I was showing you those red circles, red circuits and those blue circuits. So the red circuits was motor, the idea there that I'm, I might be doing something to improve motor circuitry, my motor behavior. Certainly behaviorally we see that. I mean, we have data that people look better, right? How about the idea of exercise and thinking? All those blue circuits. Well, that's been a little bit more challenging for us. That's still an ongoing project. Those studies are still kind of mounting and building. Most of the work I should say that has come from exercise and thinking, believe it or not, has been coming from the aging field. So the aging field has been a little ahead of us in terms of looking at those effects. There are some studies out there that are certainly supporting that, but again, I would still say it's work in progress. What I'm highlighting here too is that there are many different domains of thinking. And um, I'm just checking off those that are, that are particularly important for Parkinson's like executive function, memory, aspects of memory, visual, spatial, all those things 
we know can be impacted even early in Parkinson's disease. So these are the types of uh, questions that we're asking where there seems to be some evidence, but we're still working on it. Okay, so now let's tie in this idea that I mentioned already. So on one hand, I'm telling you that clinically there seems to be benefit, certainly for movement, right? Balance and gait. The thinking, we're mounting evidence that those are still ongoing studies, right? So clinically, there's some really interesting data there that supports this. Let's then tie in neuroplasticity. Remember I told you neuroplasticity is about connections and what are the things that help us uh, enhance those connections. Now, you would like to believe that if I see improvement in behavior, that those connections should be better as well. But really, at the end of the day, we have to demonstrate that. And importantly, we are trying to understand how and why. So the questions become, you know, if this is happening, okay, what's driving, what makes that happen? And one of the reasons we're interested in that is obviously so we can improve the prescription, but also because we hope that in understanding the molecular mechanisms of this, we may be able to target it with new therapeutics, you see. So I'm laying out to you now some ideas that we had that we thought would be important in looking at these connections. And I'm just showing you two examples, two questions we're trying to address. There are many different questions, but I'm pointing out two. And one of them is just the idea of connections itself. Remember I said, yes, we see behavior, but the question is, do we actually see connections being formed, right? That would be really important. So first of all, prove to me that there are new connections that are being formed, number one. And the second question we began to ask were questions about blood flow. And what I mean by that is to see whether or not exercise effects uh, on the periphery, so we know exercise is helpful for our body, whether there is any influence of what's happening on the body to the brain. And in one way that's talking about blood flow. So does that change blood flow, nutrients, immune system, anything that's being delivered to the brain to help support connections, does that happen? The end game, of course, is circuitry. And that's kind of the big picture I was showing you in that blue and red picture. Circuitry is that whole picture of all these connections that are important for movement and thinking. Well, one of the things, before I get to the connections, one of the questions that also came up was about dopamine itself, right? Because the question, of course, in Parkinson's disease is that dopamine we know is affected, right? And so it's not the connections, but it does help support connections. So it'd be nice to know if, if dopamine is involved at all in supporting connections. Long story short was it is helpful in dopamine, but not necessarily in the way you think. And the reason I'm saying that is I'm just pointing out three pictures here. You have one and you see this nice bright orange in the center of the picture. What that is, it's, it's basically a picture of dopamine receptors. And we are very lucky to have someone join our lab. Oh, it's been about 15 years now. It's long back down to back uh, to about 2010 or so. Uh, that we were able to image dopamine receptors in the brain. And this is an animal brain, this is a mouse brain, but we were able to make them Parkinsonian. And what MPTP, this center picture here, is actually a mouse with Parkinson's. And what I want to point out is in this healthy saline control animal where you see lots of dopamine receptors, you can see what happens after Parkinson's, that these dopamine receptors go away. But what's really cool about that is guess what happens after about eight weeks of running on a treadmill with exercise? So what we saw was that we saw an improvement in dopamine receptors. So there's more dopamine receptors being around. Wow, right? That's good news, right? So we are able to show that yes, indeed, dopamine is changing. Um, and so that was a really important point because we were able to show that also in another study, follow-up study in humans, that we were also able to show some changes in dopamine receptors. Just like in the mouse, we are able to show that there's less in the Parkinsonian individual, and with exercise, we saw it come back. What was interesting about that were some of the other changes we saw with dopamine in that we were able to see, and I'm not showing that in this picture here, but just summarizing, we were also able to show that dopamine release, whatever dopamine you were making was being released more efficiently. So it was becoming more available to the circuit. Um, and that came hand in hand with the higher receptacles of dopamine, dopamine receptors. So those two together we think could absolutely help function. So that is one explanation, but let's go back to the question of connection. So what I'm showing you on the top left corner is just a cartoon of what our Parkinsonian animals do. And what they do is do what people do, it's they do exercise. And so this is just, again, a cartoon example of one type of exercise, not the only type, but the type that we can use in animals. 
a little hard to get the dumbbells on them, you know? So basically they're running on a treadmill and we do that for about eight weeks. What we can do then is we can take their brains after they finish this exercise and we can ask questions about connections. So what you're seeing in orange here, pardon me for a second, are highlighting a just snapshot of some connections and how we can look at them in the brain. We can actually fill these cells up. We can look at all these little spines. These are these little dots that you see off this line. Those are actual uh, microscopic images of connections in the brain. I'm in, and the slide A is just showing you the part of the basal ganglia. This is a part that's involved in motor movement. I'm just give, showing you where we're looking. We're blowing that up and now taking a really high powered look of those connections. And those little dots there are actual physical connections. What I want you to see is compare it to exercise though. And so if that's a Parkinsonian animal, what we see with exercise is there's a lot more there with exercise. So one question, one question that might come up, and I apologize, I didn't show this on this slide, what happens with just dopamine depletion in general? If I had to compare this to a normal animal, what I'd actually see is these connections here in MPTB, this is a Parkinsonian animal, would be fewer. So with Parkinson's, remember, dopamine depletion is part of the problem, but we see actual physical loss of connections. So this is, this, you'll see gaps. This is actually what we see in humans as well. And then with exercise, we see a lot more. Importantly, what we see over here is that we see that there are also not just more connections, but also, um, let me diminish this for a second, but we see also that there are more branching. So here's a cell with Parkinson's. Uh, that's been hit with dopamine depletion. What you're going to see is all these little branches. These are also another way to look at connections. And if you compare this to a normal in blue, you can see there's a lot less. And here we have with exercise that there are, again, more connections. So that's a good thing. So where are we at right now? Well, let's see. We know that exercise helps dopamine neurotransmission. So that's interesting. But the other point is getting back to plasticity and the idea of what happens with connections. And we can say yes. So in animal models, that very much seems to be the case. And we can point out that these areas where connections are being formed are what I would say in the blue area. And that is the area which is involved in motor movements. There are a few, there are many different ideas of why exercise may be helping connections form. Again, just walking through a few. One of the other things that we've looked at in our group, and this is work by uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Holschneider and Zhu Wang, uh, who are colleagues of ours at USC, they began to look at blood flow. And the reason that they began to look at blood flow was the idea that if new connections are being formed, then wouldn't you need more blood to support that? Because blood, obviously, going to the brain is important for oxygen, it's important for fuel, it's important for a lot of factors coming in from the periphery to support connections. So here you see, again, another little cartoon of an animal exercising. Now, this time, not in a treadmill, but in a running wheel. And so you see two types of running wheel here. And one of the other questions we were interested in asking, besides effective exercise on blood flow, was, does it matter what type of exercise I'm doing? And we tried to address that by comparing two types of running wheels. So on one hand to the left, you see a running wheel where it's a little bit more skillful, right? I mean, you've got spokes removed. You're gonna to have to really be paying attention. These animals have to be paying attention to what they're doing. Otherwise they're gonna fall off. And notice the other one to the right, which is smooth. So think about it as a 24 hour fitness, like to the right where you're watching TV. You don't, you can totally, not be paying attention to what you're doing. And to the left, oh, that animal has got everything off and he's totally in the zone. He's totally paying attention to what he's doing. Keep in mind that both these wheels are on motorized rods, meaning those wheels are moving. They're not, for, we're forcing those wheels to move. So those animals have no choice but to run. So they're not controlling the speed. They're, they're literally put on it and they're forced to, in a way, they have to be running, otherwise they'll fall off. So. These are Parkinsonian animals again, all right? After eight weeks, the brains get removed, and now the question is blood flow. And what we're seeing here in red is the difference between an animal that was sedentary and an animal that's been exercising. First thing I'm gonna point out is these are sections like ham laid out. Let's say you cut a piece of ham and you put these slices down on the table. I'm laying out these slices of the brain, and what we're pointing out here are different areas of the brain involved in thinking. The prefrontal cortex is part of the blue area that was involved in thinking. And then you see below the motor cortex, which is also, again, part of movement, basal ganglia called the striatum, part of movement or motor. So you see cog on the top and movement on the bottom. I'm just showing you how lit up that is. So that's lighting up like a light bulb. What's the take on point? Absolutely. When you're in, what we're able to show is in an exercise animal, not only are we seeing 
changes in dopamine neurotransmission being more efficient, not only are we seeing more connections being formed, but we're also seeing that this is supported by blood flow, which is really interesting. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool about this is if you haven't noticed already, look at the top and compare the left to the right. So to the left is an animal. Now remember, they're both going through aerobic exercise to some degree. Both of them are being forced to get their heart rate up. But on the right is just pure aerobic. This is an animal that doesn't have to be thinking about what they're doing. They're exercising, but they're not having to get cognitively engaged versus the guy to the left where he's totally in the zone, paying attention, cognitively loaded. And the point is, is that you see a much bigger blood flow distribution in areas of the brain in animals that are in much more skill. I'm just gonna end with a few more slides here because I know people have probably lots of questions, but all I wanna show here is an example of some work we're also doing, and I'm gonna point out some very specific things. You see that little red line um, off to the left? That's the blood flow, okay? So that's called a capillary, but that's a blood flow. And in blue are neurons, the brain cells, okay? I wanted to point out this little green cell and that green cell is called an astrocyte. So remember, we have to think about how is, you know, what does blood flow have to do with connections, right? And so we're gonna look at different types of cells that are involved in distributing things coming from the blood to get it to the neuron, all right? To get it to the connection. And that is astrocytes. Astrocytes are huge when it comes to providing fuel to these neurons and their connections. They provide um, lots of different, uh, support, uh, kind of like a fertilizer called trophic factors. So those astrocytes are really interesting cells that we've decided to really focus in on. And what I'm showing you to the right is just a kind of another cartoon of that picture. The blue now is the astrocyte in the center. All I'm showing you is how these astrocytes can supply energy to, to the neuron and the connection, see how that's doing that. And it also can supp supply trophic factors in the form of BDNF. Okay, so I'm just going to um, just highlight a couple things right here and then we'll go to questions. So exercise we know improves, we know the behavior, right? We know about gait and balance. I mentioned on cognitive function, you know, the jury's still out, but definitely in aging that's been supportive. The Parkinson's field is totally on it right now and that's a very hot topic right now. Um, and how it does that, at least so far, we've been able to show mostly in animals, although the human data is coming, and that is by actually helping connections and therefore plasticity, right? Because that's what connections is about. It does that in many different ways. And I'm just pointing out a few because there's a lot of work out there looking at what supports this. We focused on a few specific questions and one of them has been about blood flow. And we've been able to show that indeed exercise uh, may be supporting this by changing actual blood flow to those connections. And some of the things that these blood, that blood flow may be carrying that may be relevant are things like trophic factors, which are like fertilizer, and fuels, which include things like lactate and glucose that are coming in part from the periphery, but actually being supported by these cells called astrocytes, which are sort of the way station. They connect the blood to the neuron. And one thing we weren't able to cover today, but maybe at a separate time, is the role that immune cells play and the idea there is immune cells, which we all know is, is important for fighting disease, kind of get a bad rap sometimes as being just things that destroy cells. Lots of inflammation is a bad thing. We hear that now about in COVID and that's totally true, but it's things get a little bit more complex sometimes. And in, in Parkinson's an exercise that really seems to be the case because in this case, we're seeing some other uh, types of attributes of immune cells that seem to be good, that are anti-inflammatory. So that jury is still out, that work is still ongoing, and may be appropriate for no, another talk. So I'm going to just end right there, stop share, and let's let uh, Dr. Subramani uh, go ahead and open up for some discussion. That was amazing. Thanks so much, Giselle. Really, really fabulous um, introduction, you know, to this area um, from a science level and showing us the uh, amazing research that you're doing. Um, so I think there's a lot of questions, but um, one of the questions that people have is what exercise is actually best for them? That's a great question. Well, I'm hoping that a couple of the things that I talked about today, you probably already know this now, what I'm going to say, right? So let's go back to that rodent, right? Okay. So what I was able to show there was that, yeah, you can kind of break down exercise in different types, right? And I'm not, again, believe me, there's a lot of different types out there, but a big picture, you can totally talk about aerobic, getting that heart rate right up, right? But another type of exercise that is very important in Parkinson's disease, and, and I showed those initial pictures of Parkinson's right out of the gate, because what are we talking about in Parkinson's? We're really honing in on skill practice, aren't we? 
We're talking about mode of practice. We're, we're focused on that. We don't even talk about aerobic necessarily. We talk about gait and balance, that's skill. The reason that became important for us, as opposed to talking about getting your heart rate up, is because we're trying to regain function, right? We're trying to regain skills. Parkinson's disease is a loss of skills, right? It affects the circuit of motor movement. When we lose dopamine, those circuits are hurting and I lose my skill to walk. So when we talk about exercise in Parkinson's, we're totally going after function. I totally want people to be working on gait and balance because that's what's going to help you, right? Now, does aerobic play some role in there? Yes, yes, it probably does. Meaning that there is clearly some benefit from aerobic exercise, but I would still say from everything we know so far, remember that animal that was skill, you saw that brain totally light up. It was, it was lighting up like crazy. And it was also lighting up in those areas that we're particularly interested in, which is what? Cognition guys, thinking, right? Thinking is key, right? At the end of the day, thinking is key. So skill practice rocks that. When I'm in skill, when I'm practicing doing something hard, challenging myself to do something new, do something better, right? I'm skillful. And that still has a lot of worth. And so the Parkinson's field has really been, and that's also true for stroke and, and the spinal cord injury field. They're, they've all been about skill. People ask me about skill. I'm like, are you kidding me? Tai Chi, yoga. I mean, you know, I, I could go on forever, right? Do you need me to go on forever? I don't think so. Pretty much anything you do has elements of skill. It's actually hard not to have some elements of skill. But we, we want, so we want skill that's evolving gait and balance. And then usually if I think about a pie chart, I'd probably put about 25% of it as aerobic, getting that heart rate up, getting that blood flow up. But at the end of the day, it's skill with aerobic. Does okay. that answer the question? Yeah. <laughs> So it sounds like aerobic, so really getting that heart rate up. So you want to be able to, you know, some some sort of unfeeling right. that you're about short of breath. 20 minutes, and right. Things. About yeah. 20 minutes, I would say. Okay. 20 and minutes so, of, of getting heart rate up. So just if you don't have um, something that's monitoring your heart rate, then a sense that you're having uh, maybe can't quite catch your breath or that you're maybe sweating right. a little well, bit. That exactly. You're several, several visuals can come to mind. One, sweating, right? Sweat. Second one. You don't want to be short of breath, okay, guys? We're not going for cardiac arrest here. We're going for having a little trouble keeping up a conversation. So if you're at the point where you're like, you can't finish a sentence, you're probably pretty much there. I don't want you to be getting heart palpitations here. So that's a good gauge right there in terms of effort. Yeah. Okay. So 20 minutes of like hard to kind of catch your to yeah. have a conversation. Okay. Yeah. And, and then. There's some and there's some data I was just going to say in terms of duration. So I always tell people, you know, if you're thinking about a pie chart, think about 20 minutes of that hour being aerobic. You know, people do talk, and this is coming out of the general health field, that in terms of a duration or about how long should you be working out for a period, let's say I'm going to do aerobic, you could totally break that aerobic up into two 10-minute bouts. You probably want to keep it going for about 10 minutes, though. So if you're, if you're thinking about how to do this, you could totally break that 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes in the afternoon. You don't have to do it all at once, uh, but you kind of want to sustain that practice for about 10 minutes if you can. Okay, that sounds good. So we're the aerobic and then the, um, the skill-based is sort of trying to do something and then make it harder on yourself and exactly. make it, you know, modify things in a way. So if you're, exactly. if you're doing yoga and you're really comfortable with a, a, a pose, maybe closing your eyes, doing it in a corner kind of. Doing it different. Maybe, you, I mean, Indu, you could probably, how many, how many new maneuvers could, you have to do a class with uh, Dr. Superman and she could probably knock your socks off. I mean, <laughs> right. Making it skillful. I mean, who here hasn't been able to be pushed in skills. So there's, yeah, a lot so I think of there's a lot of different possibilities, especially with something Absolutely. like what we don't probably want to do is the same old thing every day, right. get yeah, on a treadmill right. and just sort of just one foot right. in front of right. the other and we're just right. bored right. and we're tuned out. Exactly. And not okay. exactly. And so there's a couple things to keep in mind that, and we think about it as, you know, another way to think about it is cognitive loading. And the reason we're using that term, remember, is the idea that skill is hitting that cognitive circuit hard. Aerobic does, but skill does too, meaning I am totally top down. I'm in that zone when I'm working on skill. So I can do that whenever I'm challenging myself. But there's also the idea that I can do that if I change what? The environment. So it's not just about what I'm doing. It's also the idea of where I'm doing it. You try running on a trail and tell me if that's the same as running on a treadmill. Of course it's not. So you can cognitively load by changing up your environment. Changing up your environment makes this execution of a skill also harder, right? So it isn't just about what I'm doing, but it's also where I'm doing it. And that totally counts too. Okay. 
And then, um, so well, a couple of the questions that are not exactly here, but we're on the last uh, time when um, Sarah Ingersoll was uh, talking about things. One of the questions was that, um, you know, there was a question of how, it does it matter what's happening with dopamine at the time that you're exercising? There was some sense that, you know, I think question. Parkinson's patients are very worried that they have a limited store of dopamine. Great they question. need to take their pill before their exercise and they're gonna use right. it all up and then they can't use it, you know, for the rest of the day. Yes, I understand. Is there any sort of data on that? Well, there actually is, and it comes from animal data, believe it or not. And this is work by a great colleague and dear friend of mine, Jeff Beeler, who's done some really interesting work on dopamine and learning, you know, back to plasticity. And the idea is that, uh, you know, surprise, surprise, dopamine is actually important for circuits as well, right? So at the end of the day, remember, we have to practice. That's why we do practice. We practice, we do skill to create a circuit. And that, you guys know, take a hell of a lot of practice, right? Re-tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell. You won't feel badly that you're not a Beatle player, like guitar player, like Beatles, because they worked a hell of a lot of time to get there. So just feel better about yourself. So the same idea is true for motor movement. You need a lot of practice and that's where these circuits start forming. So what role does dopamine play? Think about dopamine as super glue. Dopamine helps those connections. Once they're forming, it kind of adds a sort of super glue at the end. You need do dopamine to solidify that connection. It's not forming the connection necessarily per se, practices, but you need it to form it. So with that said, if I have dopamine levels a little low and I'm trying to practice, what, how much benefit do you think you're getting out of the practice? What Dr. Beeler was able to show is that you're not, meaning that dopamine is an enabler. That's a really important idea here because that tells you that dopamine is really helping facilitate the final connection. Now, again, you're not getting out of the practice. I'm not going to pour dopamine out over your head and you're not going to be the matrix guy. You know, you're just not like, boom, I know how to, you know, use a helicopter or I know Spanish. That does not happen, guys. Sorry, not going to work that way. So you have to get that practice in. That's 50% of it. And the other 50% of the question is dopamine. So yeah, we're not dragging people on the treadmill, guys. You got to be on. We want you on. And why do we care? Because that's telling me something about your dopamine levels. Until I can take a, you know, something, you know, some way to measure dopamine in your brain, which I can't, I'm going to look at what you look like clinically. If you're definitely off, you're not going to get as much out of that practice as you are as you're on. So you want to be on, you want to be optimized with dopamine and then kick butt. But you're doth, we're definitely, like I said, we're not, we're not dragging you through things. We want you fluid. I want you on. And then I want you practicing. So it's really a good way to think about it is 50-50. Both of these things are necessary to come together. And that's what Jeff Beeler's work, Dr. Beeler's work showed was animals that were struggling on a rotor rod because they were not getting enough dopamine didn't learn nearly as much as animals that were fully optimized and on the running wheel. So dopamine is an enabler. It's not the end all, but it's important. That's really important because I think that a lot of patients have this sense of this uh, cinemat phobia or dopamine phobia, and we've sort of created yeah. that in their mind somehow. And then they, yeah. they say, you know, I'd rather just try to exercise. I'm early in Parkinson's. I'm just going to stay off medication. Absolutely. And right. we think that you and I and pretty much everybody else who's been on this are right. saying, Listen, you know, including our naturopath colleagues. You, totally. you, you don't want to reinvent the medicine. brain. Don't go there, guys. Don't reinvent the brain. You don't want to do that. We know this stuff, all right? We know why dopamine is important, okay? Dopamine is key for the brain. So yeah, you need dopamine because I told you, it's going to help do what? Once these connections are starting to form, you need super glue, guys. You need super glue so that it is what? Retained. So this nonsense about, you know, pure do yeah, forget it. The brain makes dopamine. What are you talking about? Yeah, dopamine and optimization of dopamine is important. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, there's been some other questions also, you know, sometimes people exercise and I, I personally think it's from the adrenaline flowing, um, you know, their tremor gets a little worse transiently. Um, is there any da damage? I just want to dispel that myth as well, because people are sometimes feeling like they're shaking more and they're kind of, you know, sometimes dyskinetic when they're exercising and there's nothing to, uh, for us to feel like that's a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of a practical person, I should say. Look, if you don't feel good, you might be overdoing it, you know? Yeah. Right? I mean, maybe you're a little dehydrated. Maybe yeah. you should have had that extra little egg in the morning. You know, I mean, I'm totally telling people, look, pay attention to your body. If you're not feeling good, there may be other reasons why you're not feeling good. And obviously, you know, you, I, 
I can tell, you know, everyone here could tell me that if not slept well, or if they're a little dehydrated or haven't eaten, they're not going to feel good. And their Parkinson's will probably get a little bit more pronounced. So, you know, like I said, you're going to have to pay attention to your body. If you, you know, I'm not asking everyone to go out and do a marathon tomorrow. You know, there is some common sense here, guys. So yeah, if you're feeling like you're kind of overwhelmed or not feeling good, probably a good idea to check in on what's happening with yourself. Maybe your blood pressure is low, lots of different things. Um, but fundamentally, it's what I said, you know, dopamine is important. It's key. It's important for circuitry. Absolutely. There's a lot of other neurotransmitters here I did not talk about, but we've been focusing mostly on that idea of dopamine. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, there's also been a question or two about um, uh, mood and things like that and how exercise affects mood, possibly even maybe you could speak to apathy, anxiety, depression, maybe just briefly. I know it's a complex subject. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, there, you know, certainly the, the exercise mood field, um, even outside of Parkinson's, there's a lot on that. And the mechanisms of that, have, there's a lot of different ideas of what may be happening there. But, you know, many of these changes in behavior, obviously we talk about circuits. Remember, we also talked about neurotransmitters. So dopamine is an important neurotransmitter. Obviously, it's important in movement. It has a role in cognition, but it also has a role in mood. So if I'm optimizing dopamine, I've been making it more available and improving receptors, we know that that can absolutely affect mood as well, because it's an important aspect of mood in a different part of the region of the brain, which we didn't look at. But uh, that other people have looked at that and also showed efficiencies in chemistry that are involved in mood, like again, dop dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin. So yes, yeah, so that is probably at least in part being regulated through different levels of neurotransmitters and making it more, more readily available to the brain. Um, a question about apathy in general. So Giselle, you're very high energy and very motivated. <laughs> no. and you get um, uh, but you know, for our patients that are just trying to get started at home, you know, yeah. they understand from this talk that their exercise is important and they've, yeah. you know, we've had um, Julie, um, Becky Farley, a number of our colleagues um, have, have sort of shown them some exercises, but what's your sense of getting started and what do you tell people to motivate um, in the clinic to get, get Right, started? that's an excellent question. And I, you know, I'm, I'm all about buddy systems and goals and reward and all that sort of stuff. You know, I think uh, two things, two big picture things. I think the first thing is getting somebody uh, with expertise in exercise in Parkinson's disease is always helpful because they're your best advocate to kind of help take what will feel like, oh, you know, this huge mountain ahead of you. And how do I begin to approach that? When I'm talking about a physical therapist, physical therapists, um, you know, they're professions at this, professionals at this. They can totally help someone that hasn't been exercising regularly and how to start. So I think getting that one-on-one -on -one with a physical therapist, you, you know, you do need to get the referral from your, from your doctor, um, from your neurologist, your primary care, but that is absolutely worth it. So I think uh, getting that one-on-one -on -one, uh, time with the physical therapist can be amazing. I think the other thing is um, finding your own, you know, group or social group to work, you know, to, to, to work out with, right? So whether that's at a gym, wherever that's at, you know, that's going to be a big thing that's going to help you, you know, support one another. And, 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 you know, we often talk, obviously I'm talking about exercise and Parkinson's disease, but can I just remind us, everybody here, there's something called aging, right? So we're all aging and the exercise data is also about aging, right? That's a whole nother field that we're kind of part of. And so, you know, you can get your partner out there. I'm, when I'm talking to someone with Parkinson's about aging, I'm going, oh, by the way, to the caregiver, oh, this is not PD specific. I mean, you guys could all do this together, right? So finding a buddy, going with your partner, going to your family, finding community. But uh, so that uh, support is really important for all of us. And then I think that really one-on-one -on -one with the physical therapist, Oftentimes I'll start there so that they can get some tools together. In other words, I think of the physical therapist as your, as your primary coach. This individual is gonna tell you what you should be working on and what you need to keep kind of have your mindset on as you're out there doing your day-to-day -day activities. So that two things I think are really helpful. Okay, um, and uh, uh, there's been a couple questions just about, um, you know, what to do because they're sort of disconnected now with COVID. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of chats here about boxing being great and, you know, the group classes being great, um, but that they're really kind of for 18 weeks, they haven't been able to do some of this stuff. So do you have any thoughts on just um, what to do currently in the COVID climate? Are you sort of referring your patients to certain types of situations? 
Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I mean, it depends on how much stuff you've got, you know, in your house, you know, you, you've got to, you dust off that treadmill, you dust off the, the thing that everyone has in their closet somewhere, <laughs> pull it out, right? The elliptical, the, I mean, I think the take home point here is that there are things that you can do in your house uh, that can help you get your heart rate up, particularly if you, some of you guys have some of these machines. A stationary bike is another great example, right, of, of getting your heart rate up, at least taking care of the heart rate aspect of it, right? Um, and then in terms of skill practice, um, you know, there are, as, as, as Dr. Subramanian mentioned, there's a lot of different great programs out there. I, I don't subscribe to any one because I think the truth is it really depends on what you like doing. The good news here is that as long as it's skillful, it's helpful. There's not one exercise. I think the other thing is it's always good to mix it up. So try different ones, right? There's a lot of different programs. Try one, find the one you like, you get tired with it, do another. Um, so I, I think there isn't, again, you know, it's, it's all about exploring a little bit and trying different ones and see which one you like. And then I didn't even talk about dance, but obviously dance has a lot of skill, right? a lot of skill involved as well. And then uh, again, to just back to physical therapy, a lot of different uh, centers are having Zoom programs with their physical therapists. So, so checking in with your physical therapist periodically is also a good idea. So I, I think there are options out there. I think for people who aren't as uh, savvy on the computers, you know, I, I do do myself do some walking outside, obviously to do it safely, you know, use your, your mask, social distancing to do some, some walking. Uh, maybe some stair climbing, you know, add the odd hill, right? Um, for people who have a little bit of back problems, we can add, uh, obviously we can add walking poles. Are you kidding me? The, the most hip thing you can do is wear walk. You're in Europe right now, you'd be having walking poles. Go out there, you know what? Uh, who is it? Target. Target has like, whatever, $15 walking poles, right? Or, or whittle your own, whatever. You've got the time to do it, whittle it. Make a walking pole, right? That's really helpful. It enrich your back and you still get the benefits of the uh, of the practice. So those are other things to think about. So yeah. There's been a few questions about just walking. And I think people are feeling like just walking, you know, somebody's walking five miles a day, just normal walking. Is Should they mix it up? Should they be doing something different? Somebody's asking about, is tennis better than walking? Um, things like that. Yeah, you know, again, it, it really, I, I think what you said, uh, Indu is, is really important. I, I think that one idea is how hard someone's working. And what I mean by that, again, is, you know, making it a little bit more effortful. So don't, you know, don't just, uh, you know, I, I, I have this thing about walking your dogs and having that considered part of walking. Yeah. Yeah. Leave your dog behind. Go out there and get your own walking in and then bring the dog along because there's no way you're going to be able to walk fast with that dog. Uh, with that said, then, yeah, I would get, think about getting that heart rate up, right? So you can power through certain parts of your walk where you're really powering through and just getting in that zone. You can change up where you're walking. Um, so that is definitely helpful. But I do like people to kind of mix it up. I, I think, uh, you know, walking is a great way to get aerobic practice. You can, if you're doing trail walking, you may be adding a little bit more cognitive loading. So doing things in different places, uh, even on the beach, as an example, you know, that's a different terrain that's going to, but then after that, I, I still want people on different types of exercises. So that's why I do like really mixing it up is good. And so I think, yeah, get on, get on Zoom, join a yoga class, a Tai Chi class. I've seen a couple people mention boxing as well. Boxing is popular, finding something that you like. Yeah. Uh, there's been a couple questions about, you know, is there evidence that exercise slows down the progression or, or is neuroprotective? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a really great, great question, you know, and I don't even want to get into the whole neuroprotective field because honestly, that would be, you know, a lifetime worth of lectures. Um, the short answer to that is we don't have that data. That's the short answer. I, I think um, to me, that's also a little bit like, it feels like, you know, this huge mountain ahead of us. I, I feel like just to keep things simple, right? Keeping things simple, you know, break it down. I mean, what are the things that matter to me, right? I think keeping it simple, the idea that we know that exercise helps with gait and balance. And I can tell you, you know, I've been in the field long enough to say there was a point in Parkinson's disease that all we would do is optimize dopamine, guys. That was it. And I will promise you, promise you that people look a hell of a lot better now than they did then, right? People used to have a lot more posture issues, am I right? Right? More tilting, more leaning forward, right? They, they, they are nowhere as fluid looking as they are now. Uh, so we have, you know, there's no question that exercise 
helps movement and fluidity. And we can let people, help people look as normal as possible by keeping them active. I promise you that. And working and putting the effort and the time in matters, right? So I, I'm, as you can see, I'm very passionate about that because I really feel that it's not, I mean, in, you know, Dr. Subramani is here, so she's, you know, we're both in the same camp, awesome. <laughs> But I mean, you're talking to the choir here, but it is true that the mobi mobility thing, I think is a done deal. Without a doubt, it helps. Honestly, I think the bigger questions that we're trying to address are those of cognition. That's not a small thing, guys. That's looming for all of us. So this is not PD specific. This is aging, this is Alzheimer's. The cognitive question is really, in my mind, where we need to be focusing on. Because the cognitive question is a big problem if we can't solve cognition, we're all in trouble, not just in Parkinson's, but in every field, because we have no cognitive compounds. That means I don't have anything really effective to give people if they have thinking problems. And if you think of at the end of the day, what the biggest problems with Parkinson's, frankly, it really is the cognitive question, the cognitive issues that really uh, hinder quality of life, it leads to falls and all these sorts of stuff. So to me, the bigger question is really about how we can improve cognition and how we can learn from exercise, not only if it helps, but how we can learn to try to identify new targets for cognition, which I would say is badly needed in the field. And yeah, so so needed um, and, and has so many applications. So, so, so fascinating. A um, couple of other questions. So are you a believer in starting, like visiting with a physical therapist possibly as soon as you get diagnosed with Parkinson's? I am. I, I just think they're, they're just such a great resource. I, I feel like, um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly they certainly know uh, exercise better than I do. You know, I've learned from the physical therapy field, really. Um, I give a lot of, you know, those guys are awesome. So I, I would totally uh, spend, you know, some time with a physical therapist to lay out uh, kind of a roadmap of the types of exercises to do. I also use occupational therapy a lot for that reason. They're also a great resource to help with barriers to exercise, goal setting, you know, uh, they're just a wonderful resource. So yes, when I have someone that I've diagnosed with Parkinson's, um, I often, you know, do that. I'll have um, people work with both. Um, I see a couple things talking about, you know, cognitive stuff, doing cognitive stuff with exercise. And, you know, and that's not a bad idea. The idea is, you know, people have talked about, like, I put a, like, I don't know, crossword puzzle on my bike or something like that, right? But can I just remind you guys something? All right, just let's back up here, right? Are you kidding me? When you exercise and you're learning tennis, are you not thinking? Oh my God, I don't need a crossword puzzle. I'm already using my cognitive system. I don't need a count. You, uh, look, you do yoga with, with, with Dr. Subramani and I will promise you there's no way that you're not thinking about what you're doing. So people don't realize this. Cognition isn't just something like, oh, I'm counting or playing. Forget that. Cognition is movement. Whenever I'm learning to move, I'm adding, I'm adding a cognitive load. I don't need to put a crossword puzzle in front of my face. Movement through space is cognitive. If I make it more skillful, if I'm, are you kidding me? You try to learn how to surfboard and you tell me if you're not thinking about that all the time, right? I don't need to be counting to 10. I'm using it already. So what people don't realize is skillful movement is by nature cognitive. You don't need to throw a crossword puzzle in front of a bike for God's sake. Go out there and learn to do something boxing, right? So I, I think people are kind of confused about, yeah, oh, it's yeah. not cognitive unless I'm counting to 10. Forget that. Just yeah. forget it. Make it skillful is cognitive. Does that make and sense? It should, be kind of, it should be fun too. And I think the social aspect should be there too, so that you Absolutely. really want to come back. So I think, you know, even if it's, if for those of you who like to walk, go, you know, out on the trail, go in nature, I think nature can be very restorative um, to help, so, you know, all these different things, mixing it up so that you're not just Absolutely. feeling, you know, where these sort of counting backwards and trying to do something is from probably from trials where they're doing some very rote thing where you're just putting your foot, one foot in front of the other, and then you're counting backwards to, to add something so that they can monitor what they're doing in a trial. But really, I think in everyday life, there's just a richness that you can add um, right. in these different ways. Um, right. Maybe close your eyes, maybe, you know, right. just it's organic. Something right. to music, you know, something like right. that. That might be kind of fun. Um, somebody, uh, I got to find out who it is, keeps asking about inversions. Um, do you have any sense of being upside down? Um, right, and right. I, yeah. I, right? Like a bat, you mean? Like hanging upside? Yeah, I, I, yeah. No, not, not too much data on that. Sorry. Okay. I, yeah. I think, you know, and if you are into that, that's good for you, I guess, in some ways. Yeah, if you're no, that, if you're I, I would probably... But yeah, you remember is, the, 
Yeah, this has happened with pressure. exercise, guys. Swear to God, your brain is amazing. You don't have to do these, you know, you don't have to flip upside down to do that. The brain wants blood, right? That's how it works. So I will promise you, if you're using your brain, you're going to get blood there. It's the nature of the beast. And if you do things regularly, you're going to get a lot of blood there. So that's the cool thing. So there's, you know, so we're talking about exercise and, and trying to um, learn new things. Um, there's also been some questions about like, what if you're just sitting at a, you know, at an instrument and learning it? Is that as good for these well, parts of the brain? Know, that's as a great, right. And that's a great question. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, trying to dismiss all the, you know, other sort of aspects of learning that we know is helpful. And uh, I mean, I think, you know, even those, you know, crossword puzzle, all that luminosity to stop, where does all that fit in? Um, here's a way to think about it. So one of the things that we think about in terms of plasticity and when I'm doing things and gaining benefits from it, I'm thinking about generalizability. The idea that when I do one thing, I can do a hell of a lot of other things more readily, right? So the idea there is that exercise, as an example, let's say, is tapping into these cognitive circuits in a broader way, which means that by giving this broader hit, it allows me to learn other things more readily, right? Remember, we're not matrix here. We're not going to instantly learn things, but it enables us to transfer things and learn other things faster, right? Okay, so there's that idea. And Certainly in exercise field, that's been shown, particularly in children, for example, the idea that you have children work out in class, you know, out in the, in the rec room or whatever outside, when they go back in, they do better in test taking, blah, 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 blah. So what about cognitive training? Things like, you know, whatever, crossword puzzles, luminosity. One of the things that we're finding out about that is they don't generalize as much. So what happens? What I mean by that is if I do luminosity, I get damn good at luminosity and that's it. So it's about generalizability. Yeah, you get good at a crossword puzzle, knock yourself out. You get good at crossword puzzles. But when we're talking about generalizability, what we're looking for are things that hit upon bigger circuits at a bigger way that allow me to integrate better the next time. And so things like music, you know, a little bit more complex are probably going to lend itself to that type of event because it entails obviously more than just hitting an instrument, right? You're doing a lot of planning and processing and there's a physical part of it, just like theater. Theater probably has aspects of that as well. So, you know, without getting into too much of the nuances here, the idea is that probably movement in space, anytime you're moving in space in a very complex way, uh, you know, you're going to hit probably these bigger circuits and it's going to have a bigger translation. Um, and then there's sort of scaling down back from that a little bit in terms of, you know, obviously music has a lot of physicality and it has all these other attributes that are helpful versus someone just pen to paper doing Sudoku, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's not that they all don't have some value, but it's all about understanding about where they're tapping into various cognitive processes, right? Um, it's so, and, and, and a final thing, people have done this comparison between physical, you know, physical movement through space, practicing skills and doing more exercise versus just cognitive skills, such as doing like a puzzle. And the bottom line is that data has already shown that physical movement through space exercise definitely blows cognitive out of the water. It does. It taps into much bigger resources in the brain. That's really amazing. Um, so we have three minutes left, uh, Giselle, this flew by, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and as we know, when we get together, we can talk yes. for hours. Um, and I miss seeing you, so it's good to see you at least this way, um, even right. though we've been in the same city. But um, you've also done a tremendous job with the wellness world, and you're trying to help medical students be well and, you know, starting to do some really amazing things, even in your own community. I know I've seen some of the, your posts about, you know, feeding the homeless and things like that. So um, maybe you could just give us some words of inspiration for the last three minutes. Um, you wow. know, <laughs> kind of how I know you can run over a little bit. If you want. <laughs> I know we, we both share so much, but you know, sort of um, what sort of today um, may make a difference. Say something maybe that oh. may sort of inspire somebody to sort of think about something in a different way moving right. forward. Well, I think one thing, you know, what I like about lifestyle so much, and, and again, Dr. Subramanian definitely is part of that field as well in the same mindset, you know, it, it's very empowering, isn't it? It's something that you have control over, right? And the idea here is this is something I could do for myself. And it reminds us that we really are in control of our health, right? And, and that's really important because I feel like for so long, we have felt that our health belongs to someone else, right? It belongs to our insurance, it belongs to our boss whatever, right? It belongs to university. It, the point is what lifestyle really teaches us is that it really belongs to ourselves. And, and that also kind of leads to another idea, which is, you know, health 
is really a coming from the community. So health and wellness is about a community-based life, right? It's real work practice. It's not about you seeing your doctor. It's about what you're doing day to day, right? And, and the idea that that starts at the level of a community, right? What's in your community and leveraging what's in your community. I'm not talking about putting 24-hour fitness places everywhere. I'm talking about finding things that are in your community that already exist, right? That you can use and leverage to help yourself and help others, right? And so I'm a big believer that health and wellness don't, they, they don't belong in institutions. They certainly don't belong at USC or UCLA. They belong out there in the community and they belong to people. And I feel that once people start appreciating and recognizing how valuable that is, I have control of my health and health and wellness belongs with me at an individual level, the community level, then all sorts of resources become available. And, and our ability to participate in this you know, is we're grateful to participate in this. We're, we're thrilled that we can help validate this because it just empowers people to show that all those things that you love to do in your community are important. And they're important not just because they're important to you, but also because they actually do help. And if we can, you know, come away with any point about this whole field of exercise is that there isn't one way to do this. It's very personal. It's about the individual and what you love to do. And all we're trying to do is try to help guide that and understand that so we can do a better job yet. But it's at a community level. Health and wellness is at the level of the community. Yeah, I can't, I, I, I totally echo that. And I think we're finding so much about people being lonely and, and disconnected really affecting sort of their wellness and their, it's actually a huge risk factor for bad things happening. Right. So I think you can go for a walk with your best friend or your, your neighbor across the street, right. who knows lonely and find some flowers on the way and then say hello to the, the grandma who, uh, you right. know, is a bit isolated in her house on the corner. Right. And, you know, then you buy a coffee from the local business and, and right. you can have and share it in the park. Right. And we're all in this together, guys. Oh my God. Right. We're all in this together. You're, you're there to help, you know, all this thing we talk about lifestyle, it's never by yourself. You know, it's all about getting everybody out there. And I always remind someone, guys, this is not PD specific. This is called aging, right? I mean, you can take your whole family, get them all out there walking with you, you know? Um, you know, get your little poles out there, be the trend center, trend setter, you know? All sorts <laughs> of stuff. But, but uh, yeah, it's totally hip right now, totally hip. Go out there and make a difference. Woohoo! I love that. Well, thank you, Giselle, for right, taking guys. this time and setting us off straight for the weekend. So okay. everyone go grab your, whittle your poles. Whittle your poles. <laughs> and then take your initials. <laughs> little initials. Yeah, totally. And then, you I know, know. anyway, be safe, everyone. All right, guys. I'll, I'll hand take it back care. to you, Rebecca. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Right Final wave. Yeah. Yes, thank you, um, Giselle. Thank you, Indu. This, I, I think everybody can agree. We had over 200 people on this call. Like, that's incredible. Um, this is obviously something really important to everyone. So thank you so much for your time today, Giselle. Absolutely. And then also, um, next week, we have a packed week as well. Um, for those of you um, who don't know, the 22nd is um, World Brain Day. Um, so we do have on, I'm going to totally butcher this name. I'm sorry, Indu. Can you oh, yeah. help me? Yeah, Claudia Claudia is gonna be on. Yep. Yes, she's with uh, the Movement Disorder Society, which we're really, really excited about. So we hope you'll join us. I'm putting the link in the chat right now. Um, there were so many good resources that were also in the chat um, for uh, people who were just sharing ideas. So we will save the chat. If you want that or the slides, email us at info at pmdalliance.org. And as always, we are going to send you off with our PMD Alliance wave. So if you have a camera on, or can turn it on, turn it on and just wave goodbye. Thank you for connecting with us today and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, bye, bye. guys. Bye.